I'm Quincy Newell, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell, we'll talk about Jane Manning's marriage to Isaac James. We'll talk about their pioneer travels to Utah, where they were located in a very prime spot of real estate in downtown Salt Lake City, it turns out. And we'll talk about her other marriages and time in Utah. It's going to be a very fascinating conversation and you won't want to miss it. Also, you won't want to miss out on a chance to sign up for a copy of this book. I'm going to give away this book to the winner of our drawing. So if you'd like to be in our drawing, please sign up for the newsletter at gospeltangents.com newsletter. And in our next episode, I will pick a winner uh, of that book. And so please sign up today. Now back to our conversation. I, I believe, I know in the movie that, that she had left Nauvoo uh, to go find work in Iowa, I believe. Is that, what, is that what happened? Right. So Jane says in her autobiography that she and her sister Angeline go to Burlington, um, probably to look for work. Um, and it's during the time that they're in Burlington that Joseph Smith is killed. Um, this is not a long trip. It doesn't seem to be anyway. Um, but that it's a momentous uh, time, obviously, for is, the Mormon Is that community. just because she couldn't find work in Nauvoo? Work was hard to find in Nauvoo. Um, especially because, if you were black. Well, especially if you were black, because there were so many people arriving all the time um, that the kind of work that Jane was trained to do, domestic labor, domestic service, um, was it, it wasn't easy to find those posts. Not a lot of people were hiring servants mm-hmm. um, because the the city itself didn't have a lot of resources. And they were all going to the temple. Exactly. Well, and, and to just sort of trying to survive, too. Um, and so, you know, and the immigrants who were arriving weren't wealthy. They didn't have the sort of resources to set up a household that would require servants. Um, and so... So that's part of it. And part of it is that Illinois has pretty strict uh, black codes as well. So um, the penalties for employing black people are actually quite high. Um, And it it doesn't look like um, this is a huge problem for Jane in particular. Nobody's coming after her um, or coming after her employers. But if an employer has a choice between employing a white person or employing a black person who might get you fined for employing a black person without free papers, um, then it's a pretty easy choice to employ the white person. So did she lose her free papers? Is that She never had free papers. She never had them. Because she was born free. Um, And so when she left um, Connecticut, I think her family just probably didn't know that they needed to get those. And by the time those papers were requested, they were hundreds of miles away from Connecticut where they could get the testimony of white people who would attest to their freedom. Um, so, and, and getting them was an expensive proposition, um, and local anti-Mormonism may have contributed to it being an even more difficult thing to accomplish in Wilton, Connecticut. And so even in Nauvoo, if she didn't have these free papers, mm-hmm. she could be, or the, the employer could be fined. Right. I mean, it's just like immigration now, right? right? Pretty much. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, oh, that, that's interesting. Do, I know Elijah Abel, I believe he served as an undertaker in Nauvoo. Were there any interactions between those two? Elijah Abel had left Nauvoo by the time Jane arrived. Oh, okay. Um, so he had, he had owned property in the city, um, but by the time Jane arrived, he had deeded it to some other, some white men um, and gone, I believe, to Cincinnati. Okay, so he was gone by then. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know, I believe she got married in Nauvoo. She did. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So Joseph Smith gets killed in 1844. Um, Jane goes to work for Brigham Young. Um, And at some point, uh, she meets and marries Isaac James, who's another black convert. He's from Monmouth, New Jersey. He is also free. Um, And he may have come to Nauvoo with the Ivans family. Um, It looks like he might have been working for them in New Jersey before uh, coming to Illinois. Um, and so, so they get married at some point between 1844 and 1846 or so. So it's after Joseph died. Yes, after okay. Joseph died. Um, and Brigham must have married them. Is that, uh, do we know? We don't know. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so, so we, yeah, we actually don't know very much at all about the circumstances of their their marriage, what kind of liturgy was used, um, what promises were made, what sorts of blessings were given. Um, so whether the priesthood uh, was invoked at all during um, that ceremony Seems is completely unclear. Um, <laughs> And, and it may have depended as well on who was performing the ceremony and how they, they thought about those things. Um, but yeah, so that's when they get married and then they travel, um, when the church leaves Nauvoo, they travel um, with the church and with Jane's uh, son, Sylvester. Um, and I forget when their first child was born, um, but it was not too long after they left Nauvoo, I believe. So, so 1846 is when they left, you said? I believe so, yes. So did they yeah. go with the first Pioneer Companies? Um, they, I don't think they're in the first wave. I think they might have been in this, they're in the second wave. Um, and now I'm remembering. So Patty Sessions delivers Jane's child um, on, essentially on the trail um, in Iowa um, at a place called Keg Creek. Um, so, so Jane is traveling pregnant. Um, which can't have been fun. No. Um, and at some point they get hooked up with the George Parker Dykes company. Um, and they continue to work for, stay with and work for um, Dykes and his family um, when they're in winter quarters. Dykes goes off with the Mormon battalion um, and he writes letters home to his wives um, who he refers to as Mrs. Dykes um, to sort of cover up the fact that there are multiple Mrs. Dykes. Um, and he makes several remarks about, you know, make sure you treat Isaac and Jane well and, you know, take care of them and so on. So, hmm. um, yeah. I still, I, polygamy is such a can mm. of worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she, she gets into the Salt Lake Valley. She's in one of the first companies to enter the Salt Lake Valley. Um, so they arrive in the f summer of 1847. Um, and she has had another child, so she has given birth to a child on the way to, um, to winter quarters, um, and she's pregnant with another child by the time they um, get to uh, Salt Lake. Um, and yeah, they, um, they set up on some of the property that uh, belongs to Brigham Young um, and continue working for him um, for some time. Um, and then they get a piece of land down in the first ward, I believe, um, and set up a farming operation. And Jane starts doing laundry pretty soon as well. Your discussion of how the wards were set up is very geographical. I, I found that fascinating because I, I believe you had a map in there mm -hmm. of where the first ward was mm -hmm. and, and these other wards. That, that was really interesting. <laughs> well, for, fo for folks who don't live in Salt Lake, I think it's really helpful to see sort of how things are, yeah. are laid out. Um, but I, I actually think that Jane's first house in... Salt Lake was probably where the conference center is now, um, oh, really? given, given the, the geographical description of it. Um, that seems to be where it would be. Really? Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that. That's cool. So, yeah, so she left Brigham Young and then they were just farmers? Is that what she did? Yeah. So in the 1850s, I think mostly they're doing farming. Um, you know, they have a passel of kids at that point. Um, and... Um, Jane may be taking in laundry by that point as well, um, but they're doing pretty well for themselves in the 1850s. Um, they're not the richest people in their ward, but they're not the poorest either. They have land, they're producing food, um, they seem to be doing all right. Um, and the tax rules are really what show that, which I, I found a really interesting source to work with. Um, they're online, you can go look oh, them really? up. Yeah, oh really? Yeah, oh wow, that's yeah. interesting. Well, so 1853, I guess it was 1852, was when the Utah legislature passed the law in relation to service. Mm -hmm. um, two things I want to talk about there. Number one, do we have any reaction from Jane on that? Number two, I believe there was a, a black man, Walker Lewis, um, who I, I know, I know they, he was in Utah around that time as well. And... I know I'm jumping the story here, but do, do we have any record of interactions as early as 1852 between Jane and Walker? We don't have any record that I'm aware of of interactions between them. Um, 
I do, I can tell you, um, well, first, before I forget, as far as I know, Jane made no public reaction to the act in relation to service either. Um, I guess I probably better re remember because people might not be familiar with that. What is the act in relation to service? So the act in relation to service, um, and I should say also that Paul Reeve and um, Chris, Chris Rich and Lejean Carruth are coming out with a mm -hmm. book on this that's going to be really useful yeah. um, and helpful. Um, but the act in relation to service is a piece of legislation that's passed in 1852 um, that essentially kind of codifies labor law um, as it relates in particular to black people, or at least what we're concerned about today is how it relates to black people. Um, so it, what it tries to do is kind of create a middle path between slavery and um, totally free labor, um, where people who are brought into Utah territory as slaves are converted to indentured servants Theoretically, they're supposed to give their consent to the terms of the indenture and so on and so forth. In practice, probably that didn't happen really at all. Um, slave owners who are converting these people to indentured servant servitude are supposed to register that. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Um, so, so the act is sort of honored in the breach more than in actual practice, I think. Um, but it, it creates this kind of middle ground that is neither unfree labor nor totally free labor. Um, and what's useful about um, Reeve and Rich and Carruth's work, I think, is that it shows what a spectrum um, of labor systems existed um, and, and how this is not, not exactly one or the other. Um, so, so that's what that legislation does. Because um, I've, I've heard it referred to, and, I, and I've actually heard, was it Chris Rich, is that what he said? Mm -hmm. I heard him speak, I believe it was last year on this, because I know Orson Pratt called it slavery. Mm -hmm. and the, you know, most people, when we talk about the act in relation to service, we say it's the law that legalized slavery, and certainly there were slave owners here in Utah. Um, and, and I know, to me, it felt like he was splitting hairs a little bit with this idea of indentured servitude because I know Orson Pratt thundered against it. and Yeah, enough to cause the angels in heaven to blush. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I, I will say I became a huge Orson Pratt fan <laughs> after that um, because to me it really was splitting hairs between this indentured servitude and, and slavery. Um, but I just can't imagine you know, what it was like for Jane or Walker Lewis to come here, Brigham Young say those awful things that, you know, we've got to pass this law. And really, I think in the eyes of, well, and maybe you can comment on this, in the eyes of the government, I believe, I want to say California was going to be admitted as a free state. And so Brigham was saying, essentially, well, we need to keep the balance of power because, you know, that was a big deal in the, in the, 1800s was to keep the balance of slavery, slave states and non-slave states. Is that true? Am I, am I making stuff up there? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. And you should ask Paul Reeve okay. is going to be my short answer here. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know that legislative history well enough to, mm -hmm. to say definitively one way or, or the other. Um, certainly those are, those are some of the considerations that were out there. But um, I think what's, what's so interesting to me is that Congress, um, in creating Utah Territory, said, eh, slavery, well, let's let you guys decide. Yeah. Um, and so the territory, territorial legislature has to kind of make up its mind about this whole thing. Um, and, and that's a really interesting move on Congress's part, I think, as well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a complicated issue. The other thing that's happening in 1852 is that Congress patch, passes the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, and so that creates a much more dangerous situation for a black people all over the United States, even in free states, um, because unscrupulous slave catchers 
um, can just randomly kidnap black people and say that they're slaves without free papers and sell them into slavery. Um, I think that's a, in many ways a much bigger threat for Jane um, and for other black people in, the ter in Utah Territory um, because the um, act in relation to service pertains specifically to people who are already en enslaved, um, whereas for free blacks, the problem is what happens if I get caught and sold back into slavery, which is in many ways, a, I think, a nightmare scenario. Yeah, that would certainly be. So, all right, so let's, let's jump back to Walker Lewis, because I, I, know, I know Walker was in town when that, when that act was passed, but we, we know that later on, much later on, Jane actually asked to be sealed to Walker. Right. So, so can you tell us about so that? So what's going on with that? So in 1870, Jane and Isaac get divorced. Um, 1870? 1870. Okay. That's the necessary background. So in the 1880s and 1890s, when Jane is starting to request endowments and sealings, she requests endowments, she requests sealing as a child to Joseph Smith, um, and she requests sealing in marriage. Um, and occasionally she will request sealing in marriage to Walker Lewis, which is a really interesting move on her part. Um, and I think it's maybe because Walker Lewis has the priesthood. And so... That's the fact most people don't know. Right. And so, so if you request... It, if you request sealing to a black man who doesn't have the priesthood, well, then there's Isaac, a sort of procedural problem there, right? Yeah, Isaac, her husband, didn't have priesthood. Exactly. Um, and so, so it, she may be thinking, well, okay, I'll request sealing to somebody who does have the priesthood, but who is also black, so they can't object to it being an interracial marriage, and they can't object that he doesn't have the priesthood, so I should be good to go. Um, yeah, they say no to that, too. Um, but so that's, as far as I know, that's the only evidence that we have that Jane and Walker Lewis knew each other. Um, I am not totally persuaded that that's evidence that they knew each other. She may only have known of him, um, but known that he had oh. the priesthood. So this was just kind of a strategic move on her part. It may have been. It's hard to say. Hmm. Um, there's a lot about Jane that's hard to say. <laughs> so well, I, that's such an interesting story. I know that I, I believe it was uh, I want to say Wilfred Woodruff referred to Walker Lewis as an example to our more whiter brethren. Mm -hmm. So he yeah. sounds like he was quite a quite an upstanding citizen. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I, I I'd love to learn more about him. So anyway, all right. So do we have any sense why Jane divorced Isaac? I. Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, my, my best guess is that Jane and Isaac disagreed on the way forward for their family. Um, it's 1870. Isaac is, is no longer working for Brigham Young. Um, I, I suspect that he may have started to feel restless in... Um, Utah Territory sort of feeling like he he couldn't get ahead. Um, he couldn't do the things that Mormon men were supposed to do. He couldn't hold the priesthood. Um, he, he couldn't be a leader in his church. He couldn't sort of be a man. Um, whereas Jane had less trouble fitting into what Mormon women were supposed to, to be like. Um, she could be pious. She could maintain her purity. She could be a good mother. She could be industrious. She talks about all of these qualities in her autobiography and sort of emphasizes all of the ways in which she fits into that mold for Mormon women. Um, but for Isaac, I mean, he couldn't bless his children when they were sick. He couldn't give a blessing to his wife. He Every time that his family needed administration, you know, to be administered to by somebody holding priesthood power, they had to call in a white neighbor or a white um, ecclesiastical um, authority. And so in that sense, I think it might have been a really frustrating place for him to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, uh, after the divorce, um, he leaves town and he actually ends up in Portland, Oregon for a while. Um, he shows up in the 1880 census mm -hmm. working as a janitor. Um, and 
so it's it's not entirely clear what's going on. Um, the reason given for the divorce is that the the two people couldn't live together in peace and harmony, which could cover you know a range of issues. Um, but it, it looks to me like Isaac wanted out. Um, he wanted out of the marriage. He, well, maybe if Jane would have gone with him, um, they would have stayed together. But she wanted to stay. She wanted to. She saw her future um, with the church. So it could be that he was just kind of fed up with the church because of this lack of priesthood status. It could have been. Yeah. And then um, she 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 felt more. Uh, inclined to stay here, and he wanted to go. Right. Um, did he leave the church then? Do we know? He apparently left the church. Um, as far as I can tell, he wasn't practicing um, for a good 20 years. He comes back in 1890. He is rebaptized. Um, he's living with Jane. We don't know if they get remarried. Um, and then he dies in 1891. Do we know if they actually got a divorce? They did get a divorce, they, oh, yes. they did get a divorce, yeah. okay. Yeah, we have the divorce decree. Okay. So, yeah. So, so he comes back and she takes care of him. He comes back and lives in her house. I won't say that she takes care of him, because <laughs> I don't know. Um, but she does, when he dies, she holds his funeral in her, in her house. Um, and she describes herself as a widow. Um, and she allows she allows a kind of public image to circulate of herself as as the widow of this this man um, who would have been her husband if she is a widow, right? Um, and I think that is another move on her part to sort of reinforce her status um, as a virtuous Mormon woman who had apparently a successful marriage now that he's dead. Um, she did marry another man for a couple of years uh, while he was gone, um, Frank Perkins. Um, but that marriage only lasted a couple of years and then she's back to being Jane James. Um, so so in that sense, I mean, I think hosting his, his funeral and sort of port, um, playing the role of the the grieving widow um, is in part a performance. It may have also been sincere. Um, whether they whether their feelings softened toward one another in his 20 year absence is an open question. Um, we don't really have good evidence for that. She may have taken him in because she needed the rent. Um, mm you know, or she needed somebody around the house because she needed somebody to, you know, fix the leaks in the roof or, you know, she was lonely because the kids had all moved out or whatever it might have been. I mean, there there are a number of different reasons that she might have had for taking him in that might have had very little to do with um, her affection for him. Um, that's not to say that she didn't have affection for him. She very well may have, um, but we just don't have the evidence to say one way or another. Hmm. Very interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about Dr. Newell's feelings about this unusual sealing ceremony. It turns out her feelings are quite mixed about it. Right? I mean, that's, that's a piece of really interesting, amazing religious creativity on the part of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to create a whole new ceremony, to create a new category in heaven um, that, that this person can occupy. Um, and it's a stunning example of racism in theology, um, that, that there would be a whole new ceremony created to support a racist system. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.